go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to this lunchtime lecture. Uh, my name is Anna Nino, and I'm a librarian here at Brit Library. Today, my presentation's goals are twofold. I will be speaking about an NSF grant-funded collaborative digitization project Brit Library is working on in conjunction with California Botanic Garden, mostly talking about it from the Brit side of things. And then I'll transition to talking about careers in natural history collections. To begin, I'll introduce to you Dr. Sherwin Carlquist, a prominent mid-century American botanist whose collections and photographs are at the center of this project. Dr. Carlquist was a professor emeritus at Claremont Graduate University and Pomona College, a plant anatomist at California Botanic Garden, and a research botanist at Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. He's best known for significant contributions in plant systematics and taxonomy, or the classification of plants and their relationships to one another in the evolutionary timeline, wood anatomy, and island plant diversity. And he traveled to numerous island destinations during his over 30 years of research. Carl Quist was unique in that Although he conducted studies on designated taxonomic groups of plants, he considered his knowledge production lens more ecological in scope, an approach that embraced concepts, evolutionary phenomena, and features operating across taxonomic lines. This philosophy informed his collection methods, which generated up to eight different types of preparations, herbarium specimens or pressed plants collected from the field, wood specimens, fluid preserved specimens, wood anatomy microscopic slides he prepared in the lab, field photographs, and field notebooks. In other words, he would collect and prepare all these distinct versions of the same plant, analyzing the same voucher specimen through various means. This lent his collections, the biological specimens, as well as his field photos and notebooks to be ripe for the implementation of the extended specimen network, a conceptual model created in 2017 by ornithologist Michael Webster. This model extends the understanding of a natural history specimen beyond existing in a vacuum, instead embracing the idea of potentially limitless additional physical preparations and digital resources derived from a single specimen with all these versions and derivatives linked to one another. In this way, each version or derivative of a specimen provides additional information that when viewed holistically provides a comprehensive understanding of an organism and its environment. These links will help researchers study and better understand the rules that govern how organisms grow, diversify, and interact with one another. So what does this extended specimen network model look like in the context of the Carlquist mass digitization project? In advancing the extended specimen network, curating and digitizing the Sherwin Carlquist, Carlquist collection, the four-year collaborative grant project generously funded by the National Science Foundation, Brit Library and California Botanic Gardens Herbarium are both digitizing their respective collections generated by Dr. Carlquist. The library's collection is archival, comprised of Carl Carlquist's film photographs and field notebooks from his travels and expeditions, while California Botanic Gardens collection is biological, comprised of the specimens he collected all over the world. Not only are these two collections being concurrently curated and digitized, but they're going to be linked. This way, a researcher could examine the digitized image of a plant specimen collected by Carlquist on California Botan Botanic Gardens digital specimen portal CCH2 and find links to photographs of that plant in its original habitat, as well as the field notebook where Carlquist wrote about the geographic features of that collection site. The goal is to create an interwo interwoven network of data that will provide context and additional meaning to each linked object. For a bit of background about how the project came to be and who's working on it, the seed of this project was planted by previous Brit librarian Brandy Watts and California Botanic Gardens Mayor Nazaire, administrative curator of the RSA Herbarium. The two had worked together previously at California Botanic Garden, previously known as Rancho Santa Ana, on a grant project to curate and digitize a portion of Dr. Carlquist's herbarium specimens. When Watts came to work at Brit Library in 2019, she noticed a large number of boxes containing field photographs taken by Dr. Carlquist, which was very serendipitous. Uh, it turned out that the previous uh, CEO of the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, Ed Schneider, had been mentored by Carlquist in his graduate school days, 
Thus, Carl Quist donated his photographic collection to the library earlier that year before Watts's arrival. Um, and so, as you see, I go into how both collections, um, one's biological, one is photographic or archival here. Um, and we were approached uh, in January, 2022, uh, as the proposal was being considered quite heavily for recommendation by the National Science Foundation. And we were officially awarded the grant funding in late March, 2022, with the grant commencing in June of 2022. So we are about a year and a few months into the grant at this point. Uh, just to give you a little bit more information about uh, the Brit collection, um, on our side, uh, the collection is primarily comprised of color positive slide film, which has been uh, housed in manufacturer slide boxes or ready file containers. Um, there are a lot of different uh, film stocks present, but the majority of them are ectochrome and Kodachrome film. There are approximately 149,127 film slides. So those are the ones on the left uh, that have that square uh, film frame shape. And then um, there's also some 35 millimeter slides, um, which are referred to as five centimeter slides in the proposal. And then there are a thousand, about a thousand, 120 or six by six slides. And uh, with the slides themselves, uh, some of them have handwritten information as far as the species goes on the backs of their mounts. And uh, with the Kodachrome and the Ektachrome, uh, those have embossed month and year information that gives you a little bit more context as to when the film was potentially developed and processed. And then uh, beyond the transparencies, well, the slides that are the biggest uh, transparencies in the collection, there are also about a thousand sleeves of black and white negatives. Um, and then there's also 10,000 index envelopes that Carl Quist created where he's adhered a black and white print of a given species and written the species information on the envelope. And then there's uh, negatives inside of that same species. There's also uh, 20 field notebooks in the collection with 19 of those already digitized. Um, one of those was given to us um, after his death and I'll go, after, uh, I'll go into that in a little bit, uh, but uh, it's currently at California Botanic Garden as they are digitizing it, then we'll be sending it over to us. And then we also have uh, one of his passports that details all of his travels, uh, and that's also been digitized. So some challenges and opportunities that we've faced on our end along the way is that um, originally in, in the proposal, there was the plan to use bulk slide scanners to digitize the majority of the collection, since the majority of the collection is slides. Um, the problem that was identified with this was that because the majority of the collection is that square film format, um, typically bulk slide scanners, they're more geared toward 35 millimeter film, which is a much more popular consumer uh, grade of film. So there's potential that we're going to lose some information, even if it's a couple of millimeters from the top and the bottom. Uh, but I tend to believe as an archivist or librarian, if you have the chance to, you know, digitize a collection. Uh, just try to, in full, in good faith, try to get it fully digitized and not lose any information. Um, there's also a tendency for them to jam. Uh, but I will also say that the pro with the bulk slide scanners was that you simply load up a cartridge with about 50 slides and then, you know, put run them through the bulk slide scanner, which kind of operates like a flatbed where it reads the uh, slide line by line. Um, and then, you know, during that two hours, whenever they would be digitized, the staff member could maybe describe the slides or get ahead on metadata or something like that. Um, so instead, we pivoted toward uh, camera-based capture, which the herbarium has uh, embraced for some time now um, to image uh, not only the slides, but the slide boxes in lieu of the bulk slide scanning and flatbed scanning, which typically are a little bit slower. Um, and camera-based camera, camera capture, uh, camera -based capture, excuse me, it's pretty quick once you calibrate the environment. Um, and it's also pretty high resolution if you're able to get the right camera with, um, you know, a good sensor that comes with high megapixels. The thing is, it, it requires more photographic expertise, uh, especially in the realm of color management and ensuring that you're creating an airtight imaging environment so that you're produ producing uh, consistent images. So there's been a lot of learning in that arena for me. Um, some other challenges and opportunities include, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Carl Quist's untimely death in December 2021. So unfortunately, he was not able to live to see that we got this proposal. Um, so that's, yeah, a bit of a bummer. Um, but also because uh, his handwriting is 
not the easiest to read. Um, and it would have been nice to consult with him, be like, hey, what does this say? Or create a legend for us, please. Um, so uh, that's another hand, uh, challenge is the handwriting and the sheer volume of text to transcribe, because in addition to, you know, handwriting on handwriting on the slide mounts, which typically is small because you're working with a really small surface area, he would write on slide boxes and, of course, in his field notebooks. Um, and so it's taken um, myself and the volunteers enlisted in transcription efforts some time to get used to his handwriting. And uh, we've gotten better at it, I'll say, once your eyes kind of train with it um, with some time, you start to sort of understand the reasoning behind his uh, shortcuts. And when you think about it, too, uh, oftentimes he was probably in the field when he was making these notes. So you're not going to devote, you know, the best uh, penmanship in the field. You're probably in, you know, terrible weather conditions, trying to just get the information down on paper. Uh, and I point that out, too, because one of my volunteers pointed out how within one notebook, his handwriting changed quite a bit because one of them, he noted how he was in a hotel taking notes and that was where his handwriting was a lot more legible versus in the field. And then also, um, this is getting in the weeds a little bit, uh, felt pen, you know, using a thicker pen makes it harder to read his handwriting versus a finer point. So it's just the little things, right? Um, and I'll say too, with regards to um, the handwriting and the information he's uh, recorded, uh, my uh, lack of domain knowledge, along with uh, several of our volunteers, lack of domain knowledge within botany and botanical nomenclature has, you know, been a bit of a challenge too, just because we're not subject specialists. And so we don't immediately recognize uh, scientific names, whereas sometimes I'll point it out to a botanist. They're like, oh yeah, that's whatever, you know? So <laughs> that's been a, in, an interesting learning opportunity for us in um, learning how to use different databases to search for authoritative names of scientific, or of, of plants rather. Um, and currently we are uh, exploring uh, an AI powered platform that Hand, uh, recognizes handwritten text called Transcribus. That's in its very early stages, so it's too early to say whether or not it is effective, but we will see. Um, and then um, mostly some other uh, challenges are going to be coming up with strategic mechanisms for efficiently identifying which preparations exist at either institution and linking them. Um, as well as uh, converting the metadata that we put into each metadata record on our end um, for the library materials um, from Dublin Core, which is essentially just a library metadata framework, to Darwin Core. And fun fact, Darwin Core was derived from Dublin Core, uh, but just converting those, doing a crosswalk, uh, because we do intend to push through the metadata about Carl Quist's uh, photographs and all that um, to biodiversity aggregators like iDigBio and GBIF. And um, let me, to carry out this project, we've enlisted high school students, library science students, and recent graduates, uh, as, long, as well as volunteers of all ages which has imparted these help, helpers with invaluable experience in contributing to an NSF grant funded project and learning how to handle and digitize archival materials. These volunteers also bring their unique subject backgrounds and domain expertise, which has included computer systems and programming, neuroscience, grant writing experience, and the teaching of history. And so here you can see a few photos of uh, volunteers in action, whether that's imaging slide boxes, uh, rehousing some of the slides and taking notes about them um, or transcribing field notebooks at a transcription party. And um, now I'd like to pivot away from talking about the uh, digitization project and into discussing careers in natural history collections in case this project has piqued your interest um, or you'd like to learn more about the roles that different employees play in stewarding natural history collections. But before I do, I'd like to thank my colleagues who have collaborated with me to make this project what it is today, starting with my teammates at California Botanic Garden, uh, Mary Nazaire and Sarah Dave, as well as uh, Jason Best uh, for helping me develop workflows on this end. And then the various library volunteers who have contributed to this project through transcription, rehousing, um, and just griping about handwriting, so. Okay, so natural history collection careers. Um, so generally speaking, careers in natural history collections involve preserving, exhibiting, and interpreting objects from the past as a way of engaging, informing, and inspiring museum visitors. 
In general, these roles are enlisted with caring for collections of historic items and conducting or enabling research and educational programs related to their museum subject domain. So I'm just gonna list a bunch of the uh, careers that I will sort of walk through um, in terms of ones I identified. Um, so I'll start with curators, collection managers, and directors, which I'll use interchangeably, even though their exact roles vary from organization to organization. So they're responsible for managing the acquisition, removal, transfer, loan, and physical arrangement of their collection objects. So in the case of Fort Worth Botanic Garden, uh, that includes our specimens in the herbarium, our seeds in the conservation seed bank, our on-campus plants that form the campus's uh, living collections, and our library and archival materials and artworks in the Brit Library. So uh, curators, collection managers, directors, they're often experts in their particular field, and they also authenticate and categorize the objects in their collection according to the standards of their discipline, be it botany, ornithology, geology, so forth. And curator and director positions typically require master's degrees, though some go on to have PhDs as well. Um, oh, and uh, they also manage the research and educational activities surrounding their collections, along with representing their institutions and collections at outreach programs. Conservators uh, preserve natural history collections, unique objects, be it specimens, artworks, book, film, and other artifacts. Typically, conservators specialize in specific types of objects, such as works on paper, in, that could include artworks, manuscripts, and books, uh, and maps. And they use specific methods to study objects' physical condition and factors that can contribute to their deterioration, um, as well as performing preservation, conservation, and restoration techniques to stabilize objects, slow down deterioration, and breathe new life into them. Conservator positions typically require master's degrees, and depending on their specialty, those degrees may be chemistry, conservation, museum studies, library science, or specific to the type of objects to, uh, that their uh, museum collects. So, for instance, in the case of an herbarium, that could look like a master's in botany. Systems and biodiversity informatics directors are responsible for establishing and maintaining the technologies and processes to streamline the retrieval and discovery of research outputs, such as publications, digitized surrogates of natural history collections objects, and other born digital files, um, or files that were created using uh, digital rather than analog devices. So they often enable different systems to talk and interact with one another and identify tools and opportunities to improve the efficiency of workflows and the extraction of data from natural history collections. These positions often require a master's degree and continued certifications and learning to stay apprised of products, trends, and discoveries in the tech field. Researchers work directly with natural history collections at their home institution and beyond, whether it be consulting, investigating, or experimenting with preserved or living collections, and or with uh, auxiliary materials such as library books and journals, archives, and artworks. Researchers may also go out into the field or the areas on earth where their specimens live to observe populations of organisms and collect specimens for deposit into their home institutions, collections, Researchers often possess a master's and or PhD in a particular field of study relevant to their museum or institution's mission. Museum technicians protect, document, and oversee the transportation of museum objects. They also answer questions from researchers and the general public while helping curators and outside scholars using their collections for their research activities. They may also engage the public in the form of community and citizen science efforts and programming. Technicians often have completed a bachelor's in a field of study related to their museum or institution's mission, and they may also possess master's degrees. D digitization technicians use digitization and camera capture scanning methods to convert physical objects into digital ones, usually publishing them onto platforms on the web to share with the public. They also describe the physical objects on these platforms, assigning what is called metadata to each object to provide researchers with information about the object's content and context. Technicians often have completed a bachelor's in a field of study related to their museum or institution's mission, and they may also possess master's degrees. 
Educators use natural history collections to teach visitors about museum, their museum's subject domain and to act as science communicators who interpret their collections and explain scientific phenomena to the public. Their programs vary depending on the age and expertise of their audience. Educators often possess a master's, a bachelor's and or master's degree related to the museum's subject domain or a master's in education and pedagogy more generally. Uh, beyond folks who work directly with uh, natural history collections, so the actual raw materials, um, other positions also keep these institutions running, whether that be staff in administrative roles like human resources who hire staff and create and enforce internal protocols for working at a given organization, accounting staff who oversee the organization's budgets and financial forecasts, marketing staff who spread awareness about their organization's happenings, membership staff who recruit members to financially support the organization, advancement staff who strategically seek out funding for the organization's capital development projects, and even more. Uh, natural, natural history collections also heavily rely on admission staff who interface directly with guests at points of entry, orienting them to the campus and its buildings and offerings. Event staff who rent out facilities to interested guests and plan large-scale events to entice vi visitation. Volunteer staff who manage large swaths of volunteers of all ages and backgrounds to power these organizations. IT staff who shape and maintain the technological infrastructure of the organization. Janitorial staff who maintain the organization's cleanliness and professional appearance. Facilities staff who oversee the organization's facilities and its many mechanical and electrical systems and establish oper operational procedures. And lastly, in the case of Fort Worth Botanic Garden, horticulture staff who maintain the garden grounds, growing and caring for the campus's living collections and beautifying the campus in the process. These positions require at least a high school diploma and many require a bachelor's degree and potentially a master's degree and or certifications relevant to their department. Um, in terms of breaking into the world of natural history collections, an educational background in one's field of interest, whether you know you want to go into conservation, so that might be chemistry or you know library science. If you want to go into librarianship or archiving, biology for an herbarium technician, for example, uh, those are critical. Uh, internships and volunteer appointments at natural history collections, um, or also cultural heritage collections like uh, libraries and archives can also bolster one's experience, setting one apart as a more competitive candidate. Positions in natural history collections are often found in botanic gardens and arboreta, museums, and at colleges and universities. Some of the aforementioned positions are built into their institution budgets as part-time or full-time positions, while others are funded via grants that staff seek out and apply for. And that's my presentation for today. Uh, does anyone have any questions? This the presentation, and I think that project, the project project, is uh, very exciting and um, and a bit challenging. <laughs> I have a question. So, um, so you said that some of the slides have the names of the species. But do they also have the number of the collections? So how are you pairing uh, both the collections that are in California and, and the collections that we have? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I've only kind of done a brief survey of all the slides uh, as we haven't commenced digitization of them yet. We will be shortly as I uh, hire on, hopefully by the end of this month, the project archivist and archives digitization technician. Um, but I've found that most of them don't tend to have the collection number written on the back. Um, sometimes it will be written on the slide box, uh, but sometimes it won't be. And so that's where um, we're going to have to go back to his field notebooks as sort of the main reference index um, to figure out where he might have been, because um, he'll often write the location on the slide box. So we can sort of use these different sources to cobble together where he might have been. If there's too much uncertainty, though, we may not be able to say, you know, this is exactly this plant that he collected, right? Um, so there's going to be some interpretation and having to figure out, yeah, how much information do you need to be able to validate that this is indeed, you know, the photograph of a given specimen. Um, but yeah, I would say most of them that I've seen haven't had the collection number. Maybe a couple of them do. 
Um, but the slide, yeah, the slide boxes sometimes do, sometimes they don't. So yeah, that's why I'm working to try to get all the field notebooks uh, transcribed and the slide boxes as well, since those are huge references. It's all interconnected. He had his own sort of system, but yeah, there's obviously also some holes in what, uh, in linking them together, so. Yeah, and I have a Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, a um, related question is, um, so what data bases are you using to put this data on? And if you know already, how are they going to be linked? Like the two, the specimen, which I think, are they using two biota? Yes. Yeah, so... Well, so they're definitely using Symbiota and um, their instance is called the CCH2 portal. Um, and at this point, well, we're still working out the mechanisms for how to link them exactly, um, but we've uh, talked to Symbiota about uh, developments and features to bulk upload the URLs from the other system that where we will be uh, depositing all of the digitized photographs and field notebooks. Um, we haven't landed on that system quite yet. I mean, we definitely have a candidate. I just want to refrain from saying it just yet before we've put anything in writing. Um, but essentially, it's just going to be providing a URL to the other platform in a given uh, metadata record for the specimen, as well as on the other side, providing the URL to the Symbiota link. So it's just going to be kind of a link out situation. Um, and this is all kind of new for uh, the Symbiota platform too, because I think ideally, you know, at least in my head, it would have been cool to show like a thumbnail of the digitized asset on the other uh, platform, but I don't think we're quite there yet um, as yeah, we, they need to, you know, do develop developments on their end. And I think we're mostly just focusing on putting the links out to external related resources. Yeah. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, excuse me. That's a question. But uh, you mentioned that, you know, if they need uh, to, these specimens can need to be digitized in a um, airtight photography day. So, what does the air potentially do? Oh, okay. Sorry. That's more like a metaphor in that. Um, and no, it, it, I, I could have been a little clearer with my language. Um, but essentially, Oh man, how do I get into all of this? Uh, I need to relearn all this information again. Um, essentially, you're trying to, because uh, most consumer grade cameras, which we're using a Sony A7R4 uh, to digitize this, the film slides, like using a copy stand and then a light box from below to illuminate the slide on a little holder. Um, most cameras come with color profiles built into them just to make things pretty and make colors pop. We don't really want that though. We want to kind of strip it down so that it's a little bit more objective um, in showing the slide as it is, even if it's deteriorated and it's kind of tinted red or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's like you're wanting to get rid of, oh, well, I, don't, I guess that's fine. Um, you're wanting to get rid of that color profile um, from the camera and essentially sort of neutralize it. Um, and then you have to do all this other stuff, like create what's called an ICC profile um, and then an LCC profile, lens cast correction. I'm still kind of learning some of these concepts. I'll be frank with you because it's it's a lot of color management um, things that I'd not really uh, encounter them a little bit with flatbed digitization. That was what I had experience in and not so much the camera based. Um, but it's essentially just to make it so where uh, you at the beginning of a day calibrate the station so that you're producing sort of the same results each day and there's not discrepancies in like the light source or this is brighter than this other day and uh, so you're just trying to uh, make design the environment in such a way that you're producing consistent images um, of high quality so it's just figuring out a workflow that is airtight in that sense of, uh, yeah, training people to do the same procedures and making sure the camera is not moving and, and that it's not uh, angled and things like that. Um, so yeah, hopefully that kind of, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, 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 that's okay. I didn't, okay. Anyone else? Yes. I, I had to step up for a second, so forgive me if you mentioned it, but um, it's not the scope of this project, but have you considered that once the slides are digitized there and those that are photographs of clear photographs of a plant, um, comparing them or putting them if there's a date 
that's usable. Am I giving a nine at? <laughs> oh. Uh, I'm just thinking of, and again, it's not necessarily relevant to, to the task at hand, but I like the idea of older records. I know Bob McKinnon has been going back to some of his historical legacy stuff and yeah. putting those in because it's a one stop shop for, you know, and his stuff is going back even further, um, being able to see one, you know, if there's phenological changes over time. Uh, based on a plan, because you already know what the ID is, right? We're mm -hmm. Confirming the ID, but you could also test that internal AI to see is it as good with older specimens um, or some of these weird, you know, color correction, mm -hmm. non-color corrected, because mm -hmm. uh, you know most of it is um, their AI is generated and self-powering off of modern day cell phone right. for the most part. Right. There are millions and millions of images. Yeah. But I'm curious. Hey, it's a side note. Yeah. But now once they're digitized, all of that is available because there's a name and their location. Right. And there's rough date. I don't know how rough they'll accept dates. So if you only had a year and a month. Sure. Design mm -hmm. that. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I hadn't really considered that but it sounds like a potentially interesting grant project another grant project or you know even a volunteer powered uh, since we'd already have a lot of the metadata about that occurrence of a plant and I will say I'm not super familiar with INAT um it, ha it has a browser version right yeah okay because yeah I guess I just think of it as an app mostly um, but yeah, that sounds like a potentially interesting, yeah, another place to put the same information. Um, and I think that's also, you know, part of the goal of this is it's not just supposed to live on these two platforms and talk to each other. You know, we're going to put them on these uh, biodiversity aggregators, hopefully, mm -hmm. if we can figure out the conversion of that metadata. And um, yeah, if we we're able to, you know, put that information out on yet another app that a lot of uh, botanists and people who are interested in environmental science use, I think it makes sense. Um, it'll be a challenge since there's so many, but I mean, hey, why not? <laughs> yes, Tiana. In a post-authorization project for the project company, what's next in the shooting? Ooh, that's a good question. I have not, um, I've not prioritized in my head exactly what I'd like to do first, but we did receive um, a lot of slides from Rock Springs recently. Uh, so that was the first building uh, here on campus. That was the original garden center. They were yeah in a closet that was definitely not climate controlled and whatnot. So they just made their way over a couple of weeks ago. And I think mining that historic content would be really great. Um, as well as just a lot of the botanist slides that are here at Brit already in the archives. So these sort of hidden collections that most people don't really know about. You know, so Bob O'Kennan, for instance, I know you have a ton of slides and we've kind of talked about the, the possibility of digitizing some of yours, um, but also there's a lot of other people who have slide film in the collections. So yeah, that was part of the goal too, is just to purchase this equipment so that we can go ahead and make use of it for the rest of our collection since it's so fast. It's just a matter of getting people trained on how to calibrate the system, but going back to the airtight system. So yeah. Yes. Do you, um... When you were just figuring out the layout, or maybe this is at the original proposal stage, but uh, any communication with the National Archives here in Fort Worth about what they do with their slide collections? I don't know if they're digitizing them at all, if they do yeah. that on a mass scale. Yeah. So would you, do you know, Stacey, do you know if there's anything in the build up to? I don't know about any direct communication with them, but we do use uh, some of the national standards reference as a target for the image quality that we're uh, hoping to achieve. Uh, so that's that's all that I'm aware of. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. I can't say I'm aware of communications, but again, yeah, I didn't write this proposal, and hopefully, I made that clear in the presentation that it was my predecessor, Brandy Watts, who wrote the proposal, her with uh, Mayor Nazaire at California Botanic Garden. Um, but yeah, I'm not aware. I mean, it'd be great to talk more about this because I do think in libraries, at least, uh, mostly academic ones are the ones exploring camera capture uh, systems, but it's still a bit of a new frontier because this also isn't necessarily a skill that we're taught in library school. We're taught about imaging in general, but I think, um, it's still mostly an emphasis on flatbed scanning for the most part. Um, and so this is an interesting opportunity, I think, because, well, one, you know, you're talking about librarians and archivists 
not not just uh, dealing with cultural heritage materials traditionally the way that they have about like companies or individuals, let's say in a given geographic area um, like North Texas, but in this case, you know, the natural sciences, um, which I think is uh, not as common, um, but then uh, photographers. Uh, so I learn, I'm learning more and more about this industry of reprographic imaging, uh, cultural heritage imaging, and that's like this whole other niche, right? And so I think it's it's bringing together all these different domains of expertise. And I think that's really great because I'm all about breaking down borders between disciplines, or at least just sharing with one another what we know. So I hope that we can, yeah, support efforts of local institutions and yeah, perhaps train each other on what we've done and uh, what we've learned doesn't work and so on. I, I will add that although we didn't speak with Nora about this, we have since funding spoken with uh, uh, our photographers at uh, the Carter and uh, newspaper and photography integers at UNC. So we are reaching out to local and, and also Spencer Zitterach. I forget where he's now. He's now at Library of Congress, but he was at Stanford and then he was at Digital Transitions before that. They're this really nice high end. Uh, digitization uh, equipment company that I would have loved to buy a phase one from them, but phase one cameras are extremely expensive. So, um, but yeah, Peter, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I have a question about uh, hand writing. Yes. Um, how, how are there instances where you absolutely couldn't, can't read the word and things like that? What's the incidence of like not being able to figure out a word? Because I'm thinking of various ways to approach that. Mm. But I'm wondering if, if you've tried various means of correlation before typing in, you know, in the internet, if you think it's an error. And is it mainly uh, taxonomic or is it often locality? Um, <laughs> both. But uh, I don't know that I can give you like, let's say a percentage of incidences at this point, since we're still working through the transcriptions. I'll say that with the transcription folks who've kind of started from the beginning until now. Um, so with the field notebooks, my hope is that we're going to have at least two different sets of eyes on each notebook. Um, for instance, I think we've described 10 of them at this point. Um, but I do want to make sure that we can QC those and have another person look at them. Um, and I feel like, the, as I mentioned earlier, the longer you work with the materials, the more you start to kind of understand his shortcuts, because um, he also does use a lot of abbreviations. And some of those are mysteries to us. But I think we also have tools at our disposal, like uh, glossaries of botanical terms um, and taxonomic terms that we could maybe turn to. Also, y'all are sitting right here, my resources. Um, so uh, there's that aspect. But yeah, a lot of it really involves searching in different uh, plant lists online, like Plants of the World Online, Atlas of, uh, of uh, Living Australia is a big one since he was in Australia a lot. And I'm blanking, IPNI. Um, uh, and we'll just try out different permutations of uh, letters. We also just use Google a lot. Google's auto Phil's suggestion is pretty powerful, but I like to try to verify with another authoritative resource to make sure that, um, and I'll also say it gets a little confusing too sometimes because he'll have identified a plant as something, but that name is no longer used. Um, so there's a little bit of that in terms of the changes in taxonomy that, uh, and it's cool too, because then you also get to see how even countries names have changed. So Malaysia was Malaya in the days that he was visiting it. So um, you really kind of uh, get to explore the world through his eyes at a given point in time, which I think is very fun for the volunteers. And working with his handwriting is frustrating, but when you get it, it is so satisfying. You're just like, yes, I cracked the code. Um, and also, oh, I will shout out also my colleagues at uh, California Botanic Garden because um, they've also helped us with looking over the handwriting as well as because they had previously curated and digitized some of his collections already, they've got that uh, Darwin core metadata, you know, from Symbiota on their end. And so we're actually able to, um, we, we've used that as a shortcut instead of transcribing, or, you know, reinventing the wheel and doing it over again, as we just take that information and put it into the field notebooks. So, um, and it's helpful too, because he'll use the same words over and over again sometimes. And so if you just have two samples you can look at, 
uh, one sometimes may give you a little bit more than the other. So you're like, oh, that's what it is. So, but I'm very open to methods for um, trying to identify the handwriting because that's probably one of the biggest struggles because we want to make meaning and add meaning to the slides. I don't want to just put a, put a bunch of slides up on the internet and then be like, yeah, I don't know what this is. You know, that kind of defeats the purpose. Oh. There, I think there are other programs like that out there. Okay. But that might help some with probably not so much for outside the US, but just getting more okay. data from outside the US. Okay. And that's part of INAT? Yeah, it's not really on the site. Yeah. I don't think if you put the image in, like what am I seeing? It gives you suggestions. It's the same, it's the same data. It's the same. Okay, yeah. It's the same AI. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I know and seek are using the same function. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, yeah. yeah. And seek. So what I was just gonna say that like it identified one of my plants around here that was literally almost dead. It was the sophium after it was chewed to death. And it was still able to identify it. So it's sometimes hit or miss. Okay. At least in my experience. Yeah. It's hit or miss. And you just have it take it with a grain of salt and Sometimes it'll it'll give you maybe a couple of, of hits that you can pursue further and see if that's really yeah no that's a great that's a great like tool well and before I get to you Ale I was just gonna say that that's sort of the way if the AI uh, transcription tool uh, that I mentioned works I think that's sort of the same mindset I'm having toward that I'm definitely not taking it at face value and wouldn't encourage our volunteers to do so it's more of just like a, a speeding up process potentially and then they could clean up the data if they're able to you know identify oh this got this letter wrong whatever so yeah um thank you Ale. Yeah, it's not a question. I have two comments that I want to um, mm -hmm. say. Um, the first one, I'm passing on the side, but when I tell clerical when you say that you are struggling with the technical nomenclature because I've been here in the UCC and there's so much knowledge, and, and, and maybe everybody um, should be um, or will be happy to help. And uh, I know a couple of us will teach some um, sections of mechanical nomenclature that will be happy to collaborate and share with, with the volunteers and learn with you. So please reach out and maybe you can back at the herbarium channel. You can uh, and <laughs> put some slides. Like, <laughs> smart, uh, I mean, just uh, Stuck. A, a challenge. We all know Kadet at some point or just send an email. And also, there is a uh, a great group on Facebook, I don't, um, which is the Herbarium Junkies, where a lot of people post things like they don't know where the location is or they mm -hmm. cannot uh, read the handwriting. And so all these Herbarium nerds go there and do them. And sometimes I have like, have, like two pages um, blocked at them helping us yeah. decipher the, the, the label. Yeah. So to use your um, insight, like in house resources, please. Yes, <laughs> yes. Feel free to reach. I think um, many of us will be like excited to be able to help. And my second yeah. is that I would love to be a volunteer. I wish I had time, but I think the volunteers, I would have like this is the kind of project that every taxonomist, we all do that when, when we are uh, looking and working on our groups. We are, we are kind of like going back to the library mm -hmm. and records to really understand where the plants come from and right. where they were described. So I think within the institution, we have that know-how. I mean, not the photographing part, <laughs> at least not with me, but the other part of the botanical nomenclature, please reach out and come and, and tell your volunteers to reach out to us as well. Yeah. I think I don't want you to feel that you are like you're isolated, but because there's so much know-how how to do some of those things. Well, thank you. Yes. And I will say that because um, I had wanted to take the botany course that is taught here, but I just hadn't had the time because I was trying to learn the camera stuff. And I hope I can in the future. But um, Jess uh, had shared some of the notes from, I think, one of the first classes that goes through the, you know, the different parts of plans and things. And I'm lucky in that a couple of the volunteers I work with on the project have taken that course. So they have somewhat of that background. Uh, not everyone, though. 
And I do think that, yeah, sharing those resources with them and myself is going to be really helpful. Um, and thank you also for just sharing, yeah, posting in the herbarium Slack or on the Facebook one, because, yeah, I feel like this is people's bread and butter. So. <laughs> Oh, yes, Jason. So the extended specimen network is fairly new concept. Um, so now that it's getting a foothold, I think initially it will be focused backwards on reuniting this collection. But how do you think once maybe some, many of those are taken care of, how do you think it will change our day-to-day -day efforts as we everything becomes more digital and we already have the symbiota and whatever other repository and what if, how are we going to address those second and third level uh, extensions? That's a very good question. I don't know that I have the answer exactly to it, um, but I do think that it will definitely shape maybe the way that a field botanist or anyone going into the field to study specimens might go about collecting um, and then maybe even organizing the collection or the, the information that they collect. Um, I'm not one of those people, so I'm more so kind of on the management side of once it's done, but I do think that there is a role that, yeah, librarians or archivists can play in sharing about the benefits of cr uh, creating more pep preparations of a given thing, and then how on the online environment, it creates more of this network that adds meaning to each individual object that comprises the network. So um, that's traditionally kind of been, yeah, in archives. Sometimes archivists will talk to academics about, please organize your materials in this fashion so that it's easier for us to sort of package your material um, for posterity to be able to, you know, analyze and digest and do research on. So I think it's similar in that way in that um, it will inform how botanists and anyone who goes out into the field uh, to, yeah, just their approach will maybe be different. And then, um, how that information gets funneled into the repositories taking care of them, whether it's the physical specimens or the digitized information or digital information you can glean from working with those things that uh, those people who steward those systems can then kind of take and interpret and then have a lot of a lot more information to add. So I don't know if I really answer that, but yeah, that's what I've got. <laughs> Well, I think the project's really important because it's not only the collection, but the, it's pushing us in the direction to solve some of this. How do we handle field images and how do we handle some of those and things like that? So yeah. It's going to help us through all the projects. Yeah, and I think, too, one thing I was thinking about with regards to the um, field notebooks, transcribing those. Um, well, so part the first goal of transcribing the field notebooks um, in my mind was just to serve as an internal tool for myself, the staff I hire and the volunteers to be able to just refer to the field notebooks as sort of this um, primary source of all the information about the specimens and um, the, the photographs, um, which, yeah, sometimes I kind of want to trouble the idea of maybe like the primacy of the specimen at the uh, center of the model, just saying, we'll see. But um, but beyond that, um, it's also potentially uh, going to enhance the searchability on platforms because then that text, you know, it's essentially kind of like OCRing or optical character recognition, performing that on the pages. But as you put it, it's a volunteer character recognition, VCR. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, that will enable uh you know, if you search a specific word in a field notebook, then it will pull up that notebook and hopefully that page that it's on so that it'll highlight it and you can go directly there. But beyond just searchability, I've been thinking about it also from an accessibility uh, perspective. Um, one of our volunteers had a question about how we go about describing the drawings in the field notebooks. And um, on one hand, you could just kind of refer to it in a more broad sense, like, uh, insert, you know, like uh, brackets. Um, here is an image of a drawing that Carl Quist drew of. And if you have the plant name, great. And if it even has the parts that he's sort of captioned, you can include that. Um, or you can leave out those details. Um, or uh, it may even spur more conversations in the field about um, how to interpret visuals. Uh, so that let's say a, a person who's uh, visually impaired, like, and they want to interact with botanical knowledge, uh, 
how we might go about trying to describe an image, just like, you know, with like alt text and image description. So that's just something that has been kind of going around in my head a little bit. But it, there's so many different things you can do with this project that it's kind of a matter of trying to rein it in so I can actually just complete what we said at hand. But I just think it, it opens up all these other possibilities that are very exciting. So, yes. So I have this one like one that is out of process. What do you do with that you still scan it and put it? Yeah, because it is what it is. Um and you know, within archives, you're not trying to modify um or perfect a thing. You want to show it in its um in its just reproduce it as it is. Um I think I have heard of some um archives kind of trying to reproduce images to maybe how they would have looked um, in the field, let's say. I, I don't think that that's going to be within the uh, scope of our project just because we have such a large thing to get through, a, a collection to get through. Um, but yeah, you just you just faithfully capture it as it was. And a lot of them are kind of duplicates too, just these really super close-ups of plants, like four of them. Yeah. Yeah, because you're just hoping for the best one. And I think he would also, I mean, I'm not really quite sure, um, but it does seem as though sometimes he would take out some slides and maybe put them in a separate box. Um, and they were the ones he had selected for publications. Like these are the high quality ones that I want to go into my journal article about this species or whatever. Um, so there's that, you know, kind of seeing how he interacted with his own materials and decided which ones maybe were the best Um but yeah, there's a lot of duplicates. And I will say beyond botanical uh, photos, um, there's also photos of like festivals and uh, really cool uh, architecture in Japan in particular. He was really interested in Japanese architecture and festivals. And he wrote a book actually about Japanese uh, festivals. For me, Sherwin is very interesting because I think he was definitely a transdisciplinary scholar, um, which I kind of consider myself to be that too. And so it's cool to see someone who, um, you know, while he was on, I guess, a, a collecting trip, he was also thinking about other things. So I think that we kind of need more of that um, thinking uh, because I think that different disciplines can contribute different things to one another. And of course, we do have our own different standards that we have to abide by. But, you know, some of those standards, maybe we could challenge them or ask why are they existing in the first place. Um, so, yeah, just my two cents. Great conversation here. There is another here at one. Um, so, any questions in the chat? Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank y'all.